can't come forward. Amen. Amen. Wow. What a great crowd. Aren't you thankful to see all these people in here? Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord. Don't hold it against Brother Randy for being here. He can't help being here. He's an Alabama fan. <laughs> but that is a testimony of the body of Christ. You know something? He comes over here to see a ball game and also to do some business. But then you can't refrain from gathering together with God's chosen people. That's good. Good to see him. And good to see all y'all. Wow. What a joy and a delight to see you. I am a faithless man, Brother Bill. I thought I brought enough newsletters, but I don't have but about 20 or 30. But that's good. But uh, I have some of our newsletters, and I've got one thing, Brother Randy, and I hope it's appropriate for me to say this. Uh, if you're not on our mailing list and would like to be on our mailing list, if you'll give me your name and address, I'll put you on it. And the best way for you to find out what's going on, where we are, and how to pray for us is to be on the mailing list. So would like to have it. It doesn't cost you anything. I just ask people to read it. That's not hard to do. Just read it. But there's one thing, Brother Randy, I put in this one. And uh, I want to read a letter that Nikki wrote to me. By the way, y'all know you got to watch Nikki. <laughs> they sent her to, the Philip, to Guatemala with us to keep me straight. And she said, while ago I said to Nikki, <clears throat> don't be messing with me. Put around and she said, I'm ready. If you don't start it, nothing will happen. <laughs> and then Cowboy, Cowboy messes with me. I've been preaching 51 years. I'm 66, started when I was 15. And Cowboy gets up here and preaches. I heard the message. Me, Sherry sent it to me. And he proved you can preach a good message in 15 minutes. I didn't like that. I just tried to convince everybody it takes an hour. <laughs> Thinking they got up here and showed me on. I didn't like that, but I got to deal with it. <laughs> this is unknown to me. I said to Donna, Brother Bill, uh, we had a special day for my wife. She's been my sweetheart for 51 years and my wife for 48, going on 49. And uh, we had a special day for her to honor her for being my secretary for our ministry for 48 years with nothing but a God bless and a thank you. And we got response letters and even gifts from people uh, struggling, having uh, needs within their own life, and yet they reach out. But that's what the body of Christ does. Nikki sent this letter. <clears throat> Brother Johnny, hope this finds you and Ms. Judy well. Randy and I, along with our congregation, are so happy to be able to give to your ministry. We believe in the work that you're doing and know that the Lord will multiply our humble gift in your hands. And uh, that is humbling to me. Here's a church getting on your feet. And yet, the first thing you do is start reaching out to others. But that seems to be the Bible way. And I want to ask you all to do something, Brother Randy, in consideration of your desire. Um, I've, I've been out of the country eight times this year. I've uh, uh, changed some things about next year. But we got a call from the Philippines where we, uh, the main thrust of our ministry is we spent a month there in April at uh, 3,500 public decisions. And they ask us, we're coming back next, or going back next year, and we need some real good young preachers, by the way. They'll see what I'm wanting to And And they said, they said, uh, Brother Johnny, can y'all come back in September? And here's why. For the first time, they've opened the schools to us in Muslim areas. And they said, you can go in the schools and preach the gospel and give invitations. And the end result may be thousands being saved. How do you say no to that? And so, Brother Randy, what I'm going to ask you to do, I know that y'all uh, probably have something to give to us today. Now, I don't want you to give it to me. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I want to ask you to take that and put it in a fund. And between now and next, next September, as the Lord leads y'all, instead of sending us money, if, if God leads y'all to send to pay for a house in Guatemala, of course, because y'all have been directly involved in that. I want to ask you to be planting a seed in that September trip next year. It's going to cost 30000 bucks. That's in addition to our budget uh, that we raise every year. And so that's what this little insert was about. I didn't have any more because I, I had it on my desk while I was typing and forgot to put it in there. That happens to old people. You hear me? Yeah. We get forgetful. 
But pick one of those newsletters. Is that okay, Brother Rain, for me to ask you to do that? Take whatever you're going to give us today, doesn't matter what it is, and uh, put that in a fund and just say, hey, if you want us to send these people to go preach the gospel in schools in Muslim areas where we can tell them about Jesus, then that's what this money will go for. Is that okay? All right, y'all do that. All right? What a delight. <clears throat> I said uh, just a few minutes ago to Ashley, we were seeing their baby before she ever came. You see those pictures? Huh? Okay, and then what a, what a miracle that God would dare uh, take a baby and entrust it to us. And eternal life. Ryan and Ashley had eternal life. Never cease. And uh, what a responsibility, but what a delight and a joy. Thank you, Brother Randy, for the opportunity to come and be with you all today. What a joy. I uh, preached homecoming at my home church, which is First Baptist Citronelle, some months ago. And uh, our church had a split, First Baptist, about probably 80 years ago. I don't know exactly when, but I gave you, we got some members to tell you exactly when it happened. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that church started Memorial, and we've actually been a member of both those churches. And then another church split off of Memorial. So they're building right across the road from us, not as far from here to that building out there, from our church. And I was preaching at homecoming, and I said, our granddaughter church is building across the road from us. Isn't that wonderful? Well, there's nothing wrong with being a stepchild or a step stepfather. Our two of our grandchildren have a stepfather who is a great stepfather to them, but one of our businessmen in town came to me and in a derogatory sense he said, Yeah, I heard you said y'all stepchild was building across the road from you. I said, No, Eric, I didn't say stepchild. I said our grandbaby church. And what I was saying is, we're in this together. Did y'all understand that? If we're a child of God, born of the Spirit of God, washed in the blood, no matter what tag we've got or what location we are, we're in this together. Amen. And I thank God for that. And I'm going to share a word with you today about that. What is the purpose of this church? <laughs> Did you come here because nobody else knew how to get the job done? Brother Randy preaching a different way than other people. Does Brother Randy know things nobody else knows? Does this church family? Do you have a do you have a, an insight to the Word of God that nobody else does? Do you? You know how many churches that I preached in that were new starts? This is an old day. In fact, there's all of us at one time were new starts. So what is the purpose of this fellowship? And I'm going to share a couple of things with you today. Not in 15 minutes, cowboy, you hear me? <laughs> you mess me up that bad, you hear me? But I know what time then is. Brother Randy said, Brother John, we don't care. Time doesn't matter, though. You can preach as long as you want to. We're going to go back and eat as well, but you can preach as long as you want to. <laughs> nah, he didn't say that. Let, let me give you a little introduction as to what this scripture is about. It's in the book of Esther, the book of Esther, chapter 4. Thank you. I like to see new beginnings freshness of it. Uh, there's a reason why the Apostle Paul came up after spending three months at the backside of a desert. It's not that theological training is wrong, uh, but God sent Paul out in the backside of a desert for three years because he wanted to take him and harness up everything that he was so that when he came back on the scene, he addressed some issues that had not been being addressed. There are some things that God will want you to say that will not be easy. There are some pleasant things. The ministry is not easy. The ministry is costly. You know why we take offerings in the church? You know what this is for? <clears throat> the Bible says the love for money is, is the root of all evil. Why is the Bible talking about money like that? Because most people have an attitude, I'm going to put it back, <laughs> of its mind. But Brother Randy, when he prayed before, about the offering was taken was mentioned in his prayer the instruction that God gives us to give. Now, one of the scriptures that he quoted was in the Old Testament, or that which he made reference to. But from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is a book about giving. So don't forget that. In the book of Esther, God had made Esther the queen. And, and, and it's an oddball way that kings chose their queens. They put them up, literally locked them up, 
away from anybody else for months and months and months and months. And then they would literally come before the king and the king would say, that's the one I want. And so he chose Esther. But you and I know that Esther was not chosen to be queen just because the king chose her. You and I know there was a divine direction in this. What happened was, Haman was a friend of the king and he had devised a way to do away with the Jews. Did you know that this didn't just start with Hitler? It's been going on all along. And so Haman said, let's do this. Let's make a little ruling. And, and what he had done, he had convinced the king, we need to get rid of these Jews. And so the king said, well, okay, we'll, we'll consider that. Well, <laughs> Esther was the queen. Mordecai, her uncle, had raised her. And so he heard what Haman had done and that the king was being deceived about it. And so Mordecai sent word to Esther, and he said, Esther, um, if you don't do something about this, all of the Jews are going to be killed. And he reminded her, he said, I want you to know you are a Jew, and you don't need to let this happen. And when Mordecai said, you need to do something about this, this was Esther's response to Mordecai in verse 11 of chapter 4 of the book of Esther. All the king's servants and the people of the king's province do know. In other words, this is an established law. This is not debatable. You don't change this. This is a fact. Whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to be put to death, except such to whom the king shall hold the golden scepter that he may live. In other words, Esther said, I'm the queen. And I'm not being crass, but she said, I'm the one that sleeps with him. But she said, I do not have the authority or right to go into the king's presence unless he says, in the inner court, which was his private quarters, he said, Esther said, I can't go into the king and discuss anything. I can't even be seen in his presence unless he says, I want Esther to come. And she said, if I appear in the inner court without the king asking for me to come, if he doesn't point his golden scepter at me, they'll kill me right on the spot. And what Esther was saying was, this can't be done. It can't be. Now, Mordecai has an answer for Esther. It isn't because he don't love, doesn't love her, because remember, when her mom and dad didn't raise her, uncle Mordecai did raise her. Look at verse 13. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then there shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. And listen to this. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth, listen to this, whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I want you to hear what Mordecai said to Esther. Esther, you're not just here by choice. God has put you right where you are at this particular time for this particular task. And he said, Esther, you really don't have a choice. And I'm going to say to this church family, there is a reason that God has raised you up. For this particular time, not six months ago, not a year ago, not ten years ago, not six months from now. We don't have time for you to struggle around wondering what in the world are we going to do. I mean, what are you going to do? Take a little baby? What shall we do? Brian, you're just going to go off and leave her and say, well, yeah, she's our baby, but we don't know what we're going to do with her yet. You know, there's more to it than just poking that ball in her mouth and letting you go over there. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with this baby God has entrusted to you? This church? You're going to wait until the church is six years old to decide to find out which God direction God wants you to go and then get with the program? You're going to wait until it's 30 years old? Or are we going to wait? Uh, can we take a little child? Can we take a newborn infant and say, well, we're just going to pray this thing through? No. We have instruction today that which God wants you to do. We can't wait until tomorrow. If there's ever been a time that whatever we're going to do, do it now for such a time as this. God has raised you up for such 
a time as this. And guess what? <coughs> Nobody else will give an account to God for what you do. I tell a couple sometimes, I had a, a wedding in Michigan and then I had a wedding in Canada three weeks ago. And I said to the couples that I joined together, you always been wanting to run the show. You all go, nah, I'm tired of mom and daddy telling me what to do. Huh? I'm tired of everybody else. Hey, I'm, I'm in charge now. And what I tell those young couples when they get married, guess what? You are in charge. And your mother and dad will not give an account to God for this family. This is your family now. And you will give an account to God for what takes place in this family. And you may have bitten off more than you want to chew. You may have more responsibility than you just get ready for it. You don't run back to mom and dad and ask them their opinion. The Bible says when somebody gets married, they walk away from mom and dad. You know what that means? You don't leave them out of your life. Try to leave these grandparents out of the life of that baby. Huh? No. But what the Lord said is this. You are the one that be held accountable for the decisions made. Life house. Amen. Mm -hmm. No, hey, look, 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 look. You've been thinking about, well, they, ain't no they involved in this. <laughs> kind of easy to say, well, they, uh, 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 no they involved in this. Yeah, but you don't know what they, uh, mm, mm, uh, uh. No, that's too late. You ain't got no they involved in this. No, you. You made this decision. And you're going to give the account to God for everything that takes place in this fellowship. But that's a privilege. Goodness gracious. What a delight. And I like new works. You can you tell when old buddy does, he's like me. You know. I like new things. I do. Well, what does God want you to do? I think we can go into the New Testament and find out. It won't take us long. You already know Brother Randy's been preaching the Word. You've been sharing the Word. By the way, I want to look at that thing. That is the oddest drum I've ever seen in my life. I want to see how to bang on that thing. That is, I like that. That's usually, usually come out of something like that. Right. And he knows where to hit it and get the certain sound. That's something. Amen. All right. These thighs, boys. They'll teach you that. All right. I want you to turn now to the book of John. And then I'm going to let you eat, okay? The book of John. Let's look in chapter 11. Let me give you a backdrop as to what is going on here, and then I'll read the scripture that he gives us. John chapter 11. Lazarus is sick, and they perceive that he's sick unto death, and they were right because he does die. Prior to Lazarus' death, they sent word to Jesus, and Jesus was a good friend of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And they sent word to Jesus and said, Lazarus is sick unto death. They tell us he's going to die. And so our opinion would be that Jesus would run to their rescue. Wouldn't you think that? I mean, we call the him in our singing. We've been saying, hey, at the end of my way or, or a long way, he's right there. And surely they thought since they were dear friends with Jesus and they knew Jesus' heart, he was always reaching out to other people. That was his ministry. And... When they said Lazarus is sick unto death, they expected Jesus to respond immediately, but he didn't. He comes along. The Bible says four days later he actually gets there because Martha says, when Jesus said, roll the stone away, she said, you don't need to do that because he stinketh by now. Rigor mortis had set in, and we know, theologically speaking, the reason Jesus did that is to prove that he wasn't in a coma, that he actually was dead because the smell of death was already upon Lazarus. Well, when you, when you bury someone, you remember when the Bible said that they went to the, to the tomb where Jesus was buried? They found the, the grave clothes and the napkin, which was that which was put around his face, folded over to the side. Jesus was gone. That's the way they, uh, they did bodies. They wrapped them up totally. You've seen mummies before. They literally wrapped them up. Now, you've got to understand this. When Lazarus came forth, he came from being dead, and he was indeed dead because Martha said he's taken. He came from being dead to being totally alive. Because when Jesus said Lazarus come forth, he did. And there's no doubt about Lazarus now being alive. That's an amazing thing. 
And we could have a shouting time. We could go around church all day long. And I know a lot of churches that this is the only thing they do. I preach in churches all over the world. They just rejoice and are happy and tickled to death that people have been saved. But they don't follow through with their responsibilities to that person who's been saved. Stop right there. You ever wonder why Christians are so weak and anemic and powerless? You ever wonder why churches are always fussing and arguing and complaining? You heard, did you, about the guy that was the ship sank? He got marooned on an island by himself. Oh, for 20 years he's all by himself. And one day the ship was going by. Somebody said, I see smoke out there. And they said, oh, no, no, no. There's no life on that island. Well, yeah, I saw a fire. And they said, there's no way that that's, nobody's out there. And the man said, I tell you, I saw fire. So they got a boat and they go out there. And sure enough, there's a man instead of this, screaming his head off. Oh, I haven't seen anybody for 20 years. Goodness, I've been here. I've been here. And they said, well, where is everybody? He said, well, it's just me. You by yourself? Yeah, yeah. He said, well, what are those three buildings? He said, well, that's my house. And he said, that's where I, said, that's where I go to church. And that night, that's where I used to go to church. <laughs> you get it? He'd have a split with just him. <laughs> he started another church, and he's the only one there. Well, I had a disagreement with Johnny enough that I, you know, I felt that way before. Huh? Well, the Bible says that being saved is not the end. We couldn't dare, we couldn't dare take this precious child. You know what you feel sometimes? When somebody takes a baby. Verse 44. And he that was dead came forth. But whoa, 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 whoa. Brother John, what's that next word? After you said he came forth. Bam. Bam. <laughs> Did you hear that? Whoa. Brother Bill, listen to this. This man is alive. Brother Terry, totally alive. But the Word of God says he is bound hand and foot with what? Clothes of life. Huh? Clothes of what? Grave clothes. Grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus said unto them, Pray, and just y'all just pray for him. Is that what he said? Yeah. No, sir. He said, Loose him and let him go. Right. Amen. You know what God wants y'all to do as a church? Start loosening them and letting them go. Yeah. There are people all over this community. Listen now, there are people sitting here who still have some grave clothes on. You know what this, you know the power of this book? Did you know that there are people who have been raised in church all their life? Ah, listen, we had some, I don't want to use the name because you may think I'm being prejudiced, but they are of another persuasion. They say that they're born again, children of grace, been saved. We have three of them to go to Guatemala with. And uh, they strictly adhered to the teachings of their forefathers. No doubt about it. It was honorable. In fact, as we went with them in one of their worship services on Saturday night, and I like the way that they went back and addressed things that people did 4,000 years ago, and I said that to them. That was refreshing to go back in the Bible 4,000 years and see how... They did things back then. It was refreshing. However, though they were extremely careful to follow the dictates of their religion, there were some grave clothes on them that they need to be delivered of. They were living in darkness in a lot of things. I sat there, they had asked me, could they talk to me? And I said, well, sure. And then some of our other listeners said, well, Brother Johnny, could we sit in? I said, yeah, but since uh, he's the one that asked me if he could talk, I, I'll let him decide if it's okay for somebody else to come. And so about eight or ten of us sat around one night, and he asked me a lot of questions. 
And for about an hour and a half, we talked. he talked about law and the significance of law abiding, and I talked about grace. And he said, well, we keep 617 laws that are in the Bible. And I said, you keep all of them? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we do. We keep every one of them. You think we need to follow every one of them? And he said, yes, yes, yes. And I turned to Rusty Godwin who was sitting there and I said, Brother Rusty, go downstairs in the kitchen and pour me a glass full of Clorox. And he looked at me like you would if I'd asked you to do that. I said, go get me a glass of Clorox, Brother Rusty. And he went down and brought me back a glass of Clorox. And I said, now, you say that you keep all the laws in the Bible? Yes. I said, break that Clorox. He said, what do you mean? I said, the Bible says they'll take up serpents and they'll be bitten by poisonous serpents and they'll not die. And they'll drink death, deadly poison and it won't kill them. I said, drink that Clorox and prove to me you believe that law in the Bible. You think you drink it? No. I wouldn't be an ugly to him. I was letting him know, no, sir, you, you don't abide by all the precepts in the Bible. None of us do. That's why Jesus had to die on the cross. But he, he was hanging on to what his family had said so much. He honestly thought he was adhering to 617 laws. And I said, son, no, you're not. You just proved it yourself. You, won't, you wouldn't dare drink that. I could have shown him 587 other things he doesn't keep. Why? How do I know? Because I'm a human being. And I know that we're saved by grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's what the Bible says. Amen. And we have the responsibility, people, even in the religious world, who have been taught wrong things, I'll never forget. In Canada, I, I'm interacting with people of Amish and Mennonite um, beliefs. And, and I like the old-timey ways. I said to Judy, I ate lunch with one of them one day, and it's almost like stepping back 50 or 60 years in time and eating. We got through eating, and he looked at me, and he said, now, brother, Papa, you will preach. And I preached. Didn't even know I was going to, but I preached. I remember in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, one day, saw so two young men that were living back so far in time that they still took their hay and they had a, a wagon pulled by mules and had a pole in the middle and they took their hay and they threw it and it just stuck on top of it. They didn't believe in using machinery to bail hay. And I stopped and I looked up the boys were about 15 or 16. I said, fellas, just want to ask you if you know Jesus as your Savior. Sir, I, uh, we don't know. I said, in other words, have you ever repented of your sin? And confess that Jesus is the only hope and salvation. And have you ever invited Him into your heart? And they said, you'll have to ask our parents that, sir. Sixteen-year-old boys, they didn't have a concept. that They were separated from the lives. Didn't, in their life, didn't even believe in using electricity. They went back in life. They were living moral lives, but they knew nothing of the blood of Jesus Christ. The people in religious realms that you as a church family have the responsibility. And you know how to teach them? Get your Baptist book down and teach them the Baptist way. No, the Methodist way. No, teach them the Catholic way. No, no, no. no. This is the book where you give instruction. I told the folks, everybody's heard me before, you've heard me say it, but y'all forget it anyhow, so I'm going to tell you again. But I preached a message one time on husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. When I got through preaching, I wasn't the best husband I ever lived, but I wasn't the sorriest, you know. <laughs> Probably, but, but you know, but top 80%, you know. Yeah. That's the best of the first. Yeah. Went outside and opened the door for Judy for her to get in the car. And as soon as I opened the door, she started to get, she turned, she said, honey, that was a great message on husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for them. And I said, well, thank you, baby. She said, now I want you to practice what you preach. <laughs> you know what I did? I slapped her. No, I didn't. No, I'm still living, so I didn't slap this Judy. You hear me? <laughs> you know what Judy was saying? She said, let me tell you something, big boy. Anybody can get up there in that pulpit and talk it. But when you walk it, I know you're the real deal. She said, I wasn't, I'm not all that impressed by what you say when you're up there talking, but I sure am when I see you living it. Somebody said the old Chinese proverb, too much talkie-talkie and not enough walkie-walkie. <laughs> That's what Judy was saying. 
Anything wrong with that? Sounds kind of biblical to me, doesn't it? You know what the Lord said? Loosen and let it go. Y'all, we've got, we got to remember this. We're dealing with some people that even in the religious realm, they've been taught erroneously and they don't have a clue that what they've been taught is not in the Bible. And we have the responsibility, Brother Randy, it may take you 10 or 15 years. You can't just jump up and start and go back. It may take you 15 years to teach biblical truth to some people that one day God will cut the light on and they'll say, I understand. I see that. But that's our responsibility. You know what Paul said to him? He said, I wish I could feed you meat. He said, it tickle me to death if you knew how to take a steak and cut it and eat it. He said, but you only, you're still sucking the bottle. But he said, if that's the only thing to keep you alive, I'm going to give you that. Brother Randy, any time you as pastor will have to stick a bottle in people's mouth that you'll say, where are you going to grow up? What, 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 why are you acting like this? Why do you behave? Why are you doing this? But you still got to do that to keep them alive. Because the day may come that you can cut them off a piece of meat and they'll say, I like that. And they grow. Don't forget, not only are they do they have the great clothes of religious teaching line, but there are people out there that they just never have known the right way. Morally. Who are you going to tell people not living morally right? If you're coming to this church, I'll tell you, you go dress like we think you're going to dress. You know, straighten up. Well, I'll tell you what, you come to our church, you will do things like we think ought to be done. Who do you think you ought to tell folks they're going to do what you think ought to be done? Who's church? Oh, oh, it's your church, so you can tell them that, huh? Is it your church? Oh, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. There are going to be people come here that you want to how in the name of common sense can you do that? Judy and I have been married 48 and a half years. She still thinks that about me sometimes. <laughs> there are people who weren't raised like we do. I, Brother Randy, <clears throat> I lived watching a mom and dad give. I never saw my mother and dad not respond to somebody in need. So for me to give is not a big issue. Because that's, that's all I ever knew. But just because I know what the Bible says about giving does not mean that I'm to ostracize and berate somebody else that never was taught what it meant to give. You know what Rusty got and said to me, Brother Randy? Rusty's when I said, I told him to go get that clothes on. I didn't have a clue about this. I preached for a Bible in Rusty's home church before he ever went to Guatemala with us. And he said, Brother Johnny, my dad always taught us, don't give because you'll need all the money you got the rest of your life. Hold on to it. And he said, that's all I ever heard all my life. And by the way, he lived right there going in this house. Right going in Rusty's house right now. He said, my daddy said, hold on to it. Don't you dare give it. And Rusty said, Brother Johnny, he went to Livingston University where our son played football and they were going to the same church. I don't even remember this. Brandy, our grandbaby, was about 18 months old. She was sitting on the pew with us. So I, I, don't, I don't have a clue who it is, because like I said, I don't remember, but there was somebody in the community had a need. And Rusty said he was sitting, Shane was by me with Brandy, and Rusty was on the other side, and he said, Brother John, you took a $100 bill out of your pocket, put it in an offering plate, you didn't know who the guy was, never saw him, and he said, I have never, ever gotten over that. Ever. I didn't get that money. That I don't even remember doing it. But y'all listen, just because you know what it means to read the Bible every day, somebody comes into this church and they read it every month, don't look down your nose at them. Loose them and let them go. Let them see the delight to read the Word of God. I go to church sometime and somebody let me know, Brother Tucker, I read the Bible through four times last year. You know what I want to tell them? I don't give a hoot. Just want you practice one verse where he says, pride goes before destruction and the Holy Spirit before downfall. Quit being so prideful about what you've done. Reading the Bible. No, don't, don't, don't look down your nose at people because they don't see things like you do. You know what the Bible says? Lazarus was as alive as he had ever been, but he still was clothed with garments of death. 
And Jesus said to the church, you, he could have done it. I mean, Jesus could just snatch his finger. He said, Lazarus has come forth and he brought him back from the dead. You think Jesus couldn't have said, all right, great clothes, be gone. Of course he could. But he looked at the church and he said, hey, I'm going to let y'all be involved in this. I want you now to loose him and let him go. What a privilege. What a privilege. You know why we go do mission work? Those poor folks down there? No. It's because He has given us grace and we have the privilege of going and telling them. Because it's our privilege to... You know what? Did you know the Lord has loosed us to let us go? How many times have I had people to share words of truth to me and preach the Gospel to me? I'll never forget the first time I met my, our baby's pastor, Deidre Ann is 42, but she's still my baby. 43 now. Uh, we went to their church a couple of years ago and Brother Josh preached the message on the family. Brother Randy, God broke my heart about my failing my family. I ran down the aisle and I said, Brother Josh, I can choose to be a better daddy and a better granddaddy and a better husband and a better son. But I can't choose to be a better son-in-law because my mother-in-law died a couple of months ago. And that's been taken away from me. I'll never ever be able to be a better son-in-law. But I can choose to obey God and let some of those grave clothes come off. You see, Jesus turned to this church family. He said, now here's what I've done. I've established you as a new father. Now, here's what I want you to do. Loose them and let them go. You know how people know that you're happy to be a grandpa? Because I tell them. Did you know I have never, Judy and I have been married 48 years, I've never preached anywhere that they didn't tell me, bring this Judy back. They've never met her. You know why they said, we got to find a woman to live with you. No. <laughs> I've had people write letters from the Philippines to Miss Judy and say, Miss Judy, I've never met you. One woman said to me, but the way you speak about your wife in the pulpit is overwhelming to me. You don't have to meet Judy to know that she's a great person and a great wife. If I am happily married, you'll know that. If I'm a happy grandpa, mm-hmm, yeah. You know how you know? Look here. Take my deer picture out of this old thing. That's my important. <laughs> Barry, don't laugh at me now. Look at that. You know that is? That's my family. That's my granddaughter. That's my grandson and his winky pink, we call him. Girlfriend. <laughs> that is, uh... Oh, there, there's Christmas. And... You know how you know if I'm a happy grandpa? You ain't got to be around me long to find out. That's my grandson, Ditchin. Pretty good. <laughs> you know how you know? I can't hide it. If, I, if I'm a happy grandpa, you're going to know it. And if I'm a happy child of God, yeah, I can't hide that. Yeah. You know how you lose them and let them go? You don't have to always be using your mouth. Every now and then we'd be sitting around a table. In fact, is my wife did it twice last night at supper. She reminds me of Nikki. <laughs> we'd be sitting around a table talking, and I'll feel a little touch under the table. Now, for those of you who've never met me before, what do you think Judy's telling me? Yes. <laughs> Talking too much. She did it twice at supper last night. <laughs> We're eating in the garden of Eden. Or whatever that place is called. But eating something. She touched me twice. Said, listen, did you know everybody says they hear me before they see me? <laughs> Something I've had to deal with for 66 years. Right. I can't blame it on God because I'm a type A personality and I love life and I'm aggressive. And, yeah. But you, you say, well, Brother Johnny, that's good to be aggressive. Yeah, unless the Bible says be temperate in how many things? All things. When I had my heart failure 13 years ago, I found out I wasn't temperate in anything. So you got, listen, church, you got people 
who still have grain clothes on. Some of us do, don't we? You know what we're responsible to do? Jesus turned to the church and He said, you loose them and let them go. That's our responsibility. We do it by the way we live, by what we teach, by our attitudes. You know how to show people the right attitude to have? I'll tell you one thing. You better have a good attitude. Is that the way to do it? <laughs> You have been around these people is kind of <laughs> you see. Oh, how about preach to them all the time? <laughs> you know how to teach people what a good attitude will do? Just let them see it. Let me share this and I'll quit. I preached down in um, Conroe or over in Conroe. And um, I was at a church out on the other side of there. I said to them, I never, no, 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 no. That was the second church doctrine was in. I said, uh, I, I did not know this church existed until Dr. Hill called me and asked me to preach. And I said, since I, I've only been here for four days, and um, there is an individual in this church who has the gift of kindness. They have, they were in an area that the church had been forced to think they couldn't reach out, couldn't minister. And they just kind of shriveled up and were just kind of ministering to each other, paying their bills and tickled to death about not doing anything but to one another. And I said, there is an individual in this church who manifests the gift of kindness. And I know that gift is so evident. I know that you know who it is. And what I, I, I said, there were 90 people, the 91 count me, sitting there that morning. We would meet in the fellowship hall and I'd preach while they were eating. Let's work. Wish we could do that so we could be right now. We'll do it in a minute. And we had the horseshoe table set up around there. And I said, there's a piece of paper and a pencil on the table. And here's what I want you to do. That person who manifests the gift of kindness in this fellowship, I want you to write that person's name down. And I know that you know it so much. I've written that person's name down. And here it is right here. And I promise you, I know what you're going to say. Brother Randy, of the 91 people in that church, 90 of them wrote that precious lady's name down. Are you listening to that? Everybody there but one did not know who that precious lady was. And I told the church several years later what I just told you. And a little elderly lady came up to me after church and she said, Brother Tucker, there wasn't one person in the church that didn't know who that woman was. She wouldn't have dared written her name on name down. I said, that's right. Y'all, did you hear that? You think having a kind attitude is not important? Would you please tell me how everybody in that church knew exactly who I was talking about? And if you've got a mean, ugly attitude, everybody in this church knows that. <coughs> but if you've got a good, healthy, sweet attitude, it will permeate this fellowship and radically change what you're trying to do for the glory of God. Loose them and let them go. That's what God's called us to do. We don't just win them to faith in Christ. We have a responsibility. Listen to this. Bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Even bearing burdens loosens them and lets them go. There are people that need for us to just sit down and let them vent. And once they get it vented, they're okay. Loose them. The body of Christ. For such a time as this, God has put you here for you to loose people and let them go. People that are alive in Christ, that they need help. We need help. We need to, and that's why it's important to interact with one, interact with one another so that we can be loosing one another and letting one another go so that the body of Christ can grow in strength and grace and we can minister hope. There are hurting, broken people out there some of them are saved that aren't in a church. And your attitudes about loosing them and letting them go might bring them back into the floor in the fullness of joy. It's our responsibility. Not just our responsibility, it's our privilege. Let's pray. I'm going to ask you to stand if you will. Brother Ryan, y'all come, if you will, and play some soft music. And we just want you to have a time to consider. Have you been have you been involved in loosing 
and letting go. Have you? Now, it doesn't mean to conform people into our image or talk them into doing things like we think they ought to be done. But just, just with this word, living it, talking it, and, li and doing it. And sometimes letting them do it. Loose them and let them go. That's our calling from God. And people cannot. Listen, Lazarus, the Lamb of God was there. He, Jesus literally brought him back from the dead. And Jesus turned to you and me and said, Now, here's your part. Loose him. Let him go. And it may be that you want to make a public acknowledgement of that and say, Hey, I, I, I want to be a part of that. I, I want to be one. I want God to use me that we can lose him and let him go. Whatever the need. Let's pray to God. Father, thank you that for such a time as this, you've raised this fellowship up. Put this family together. You're putting it together day by day by day. I pray that you give them grace on this commission that you've given them, not just to go into all the world, but to those right here where we've been called to lose them and let them go. We want to do that. God, give us grace that we'll do that in Jesus. Brother Randy is going to be available. You might need to come and say, hey, Brother Randy, I, I, I'm going to be a part of this loosing and letting go. What about it? I want to be a part of loosing and letting go.